to the to the belt to the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger. Ready to move out. Captain America said, you gotta be like me or you're gonna wind up dead at the end of your road. Hey guys, welcome back to East Meets West. On this, we will be breaking down the newly released Teen Titans vs. the Justice League. Yeah, there's, uh, there's been a lot of negative opinion about this movie. It looks like DC's been getting a lot of that lately. Now, I don't really understand where the hate is coming from, other than it's not really Teen Titans versus the Justice League per se. It's more Teen Titans and Justice League versus the main villain in the film, Trigon. Yeah, I like if any I'm pretty sure most of the hate is stemming from the fact that the title was a bit misleading. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Teen Titans do fight the Justice League for like a brief moment and get completely and utterly wrecked. It was not a close battle like at all. I I'm a bit disappointed in how Starfire really didn't do much in this, considering all she was really used for is fan service, and I mean, her, her fight with Wonder- Oh, yeah, by the way, spoilers in case you didn't notice, um, yeah, that whole fight between her and Wonder Woman was an absolute joke, like, what, what do you make of that? Stop bitching. You know why? Nightwing wasn't even in the damn thing. Yeah, that's- He- that's... I mean, he was. He was. Don't get me wrong. But he was only in for one eighth, and then at the ending, when they show the main heroes, the Teen Titans, Starfire, and long along with Cyborg. But guess who's showing up right there in the mix? Nightwing. And it makes you wonder, what the heck did he do? All he did was bring Damien there. Like other, he was literally a bus boy. Other than looking at Starfire's breast on Skype, not much. He didn't really do anything. He's just sort of a taxi driver. That's essentially all he did. Yeah, that's that. That's it. I mean, uh, I don't even know where to begin with that. Like, I'm just disappointed we didn't see Nightwing more. Eh, I mean, eh, I, I I don't know. I don't know. But that fight between Damien and Blue Beetle, kind of funny. That is pretty funny. Yeah, especially when he got half his face burned off. And he was like, oh, what happened? You just got knocked up out, bitch. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that was a, f a fun little brain teaser there. Yeah. We did get some decent story building of Raven's backstory. The backstory, it was interesting and all, but what the heck? Like, her mother was in some type of Satanist cult. They managed to summon some demon or some guy with long hair, and she didn't hesitate to go and, like, have sex with the guy. Like, did no red flags ever pop up? Like, ever? Like, what? She's gullible, as Raven said. That's be that's beyond gullible right there. That's like she's terrible at making decisions. Like dude. yeah, and unfortunately, it was a bit hereditary. And can we just stop and marvel on Blue Beetle's stupidity when he asked, "Hey, why not go back to Azeroth?" As Raven was telling them their story, and I'm just like, "You're standing in the ruins of it." <laughs> like way to be like, here's your sign. Like what the heck? Like look around you. You're here. Like, really, like, this happens, like, right after she tells the story of how this her home planet, kind of, was destroyed when she was messing around with trying to get Trigon back so she can meet him and have some fatherly bonding time, but... Yeah, but that went south yeah. in so many ways. 
And he just kind of wrecked her home world. So he didn't just wreck it; he eviscerated. He nearly like just wiped it off of the primordial ether from whence it came. Like, come on. Yeah, like it just like was gone. And then Blue Beetle's like, "Why don't you just go home?" Not smart. We should look at the highlights of the film, though. Like, for example, we have Damien. He gets like, some good character development. Exactly. He's not as much of a loner anymore, even though he so kind of is. It takes one emo to get another, in the case of him and Raven. Yeah, we are. I can already see the shippers coming through, shipping that uh, little travesty. I personally, for one, am not for it, and I honestly don't even care for it. But whatever, whatever, like, ups the ratings, I guess. What? Like, I'm really, what I'm really curious is, like, about this, like, where are people's power levels at? Because apparently Superman, it still seems to be kind of a beginner because, one, he managed to get possessed. And for those of you who are big time fans of Superman, especially All-Star Superman, knows that that shouldn't be possible anymore. Like, eventually he goes through some type of training to block any type of psychic or some kind of psychic trance so he can never be, um hypnotized and he actually was bleeding so i'm just wondering what is this superman that we see here still a bit of a noob it definitely appears that way it definitely appears that way and it also seems to be continuing right off i think like i love there's one thing i do like about the dc animated series like movies is that they are seemingly managed to connecting all the animated movies together like diana and clark are still an item it appears and we already know damien and bruce are still like a thing so it's kind of like incorporating all the other movies from like batman like son of batman or batman versus robin and then we also get a few other dc anime series that also been like um also been animated they're also kind of bringing it together and also connecting it so that's very nice one thing, one pet peeve I had was, and it's really just a pet peeve, but when Starfire said Teen Titans Go, I didn't feel it. Did you? And her transformation? Hello, Sailor Moon. Yeah, like, that's just, you can't, like, I, you can't say that wasn't Sailor Moon to me. Like, that, that definitely was to me. That was definitely, that was definitely the changing aspect of Sailor Moon. And the one thing I find funny how all three of them were changing and, and Damien Damien just had to just go back to the car. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no, I left my sword. Uh, so, I mean... Maybe next time, Damien. Though, I have to say, though, out of all the uh, Titans, though, for some... Like, you gotta say, though, Damien did put in work. He yeah. definitely did put in work. So much work that Blue Beetle wanted him to stop and he forced the simulator to turn off. Wait, yeah, and we all know how that resulted. Half his face got burned off. The one thing that I am kind of critical on is the age range between the characters. Because I'm just not used to Starfire and Nightwing being so much older than Raven and Beast Boy. Just it just doesn't seem right. Like this is for anyone who's fans of the um the old the old cartoon, you know, Teen Titans Go not Teen Titans Go. Teen Titans Go, get that out of here. Like, <laughs> yeah, let's No. No. Like the other Teen Titan, the one with the high puffy on Miyumi opening that if you're coming off of that if you're coming off of that series and you're jumping right into this movie, you're gonna be completely disoriented here because it, it's out of left field, because I also was surprised to see that in this rendition, Raven was still so young. Cyborg was now part of the Justice League. <sighs> Although he is kind of in the Justice League, Cyborg being there was justified. But see, the thing is, though, I never understood. Like, first, he, like out of all the DC material we get from both the games, the comics, and the s animated series, a lot of people saying that Cyborg was part of the original Justice League, but I'm just wondering, but how many times has he been in the Teen Titans? Like, can, like I, I have no words. Can anyone explain this? It's due, it's, it's due to the new 52 universe and how they changed and mixed things up. Yeah, but the new 52 is over. Well, not yet. One more month ago. Um, well, there is one thing. Speaking of the, um, old Teen Titans cartoon, I liked how when they were in hell, 
and they were trying to, you know, find a way to stop Trigon. I liked how they kind of brought back Beast Boy turning into, like, that were beast thing. I personally think that was a shout-out to the cartoon, like, to the cartoon series. For those of you who don't know that one episode where he fought Adonis and they both turned into were creatures or more popularly when he was in when during the episodes called the end and they were all trying to fight off to protect raven another lovely arc featuring trigon so i kind of think that whole sequence when he's turning into a whole bunch of different animals and monsters i think that's kind of a shout out to the the cartoon i kind of think it was a shout out especially the were one the were beast transformation not sure why or how that was brought on do you have any uh, speculations to that because i have i'm guessing because he's in the hell and he can take the shape of the creatures that inhabit that world so i'm guessing that's what it is probably like yeah because i believe also in the cartoon it was also hinted at that he could transform into other like uh space animals as well so probably we also see him turn into a griffin but um can we talk about some of the level of savagery that was in this movie like yeah like yeah savage at uh, no chill like no chill like the interact like in the beginning of the film the interactions between the characters they're just like let's be real they're straight up jerks towards each other they're straight up jerks they are ripping into one another so much my favorite line was how they were referencing blue beetle and how he doesn't really have much control over his alien counterpart scarab raven makes the assumption and the parallel to Beast Boy not being able to control his pants. Now, that could be misinterpreted in so many ways. And... Uh, but just the level of savagery in this... Uh, I'm happy they at least kept the relationship between Raven and Beast Boy kind of similar to what we... M probably what m many of TV fans are used to. Basically, Beast Boy being a butt monkey and Raven just being the straight man or straight girl in this sense. Yeah, more or less. I don't really want to spoil too much of it away. However, the ending. Ah, uh, yes, the ending. That that cliffhanger. Yes. Nice job in the cliffhanger. Because, uh, Cliff, get it? Wow. Ha, ha, ha. Because you know who's on her way? Tara. And I'm guessing she's not bringing baskets of fun. Well, at the very least, we do realize that the sequel's coming. Some torp we'll, We're definitely seeing the Teen Titans again. We're definitely seeing them again. Speaking of that, during WonderCon, the producer, James Tucker, said, depending on the sales figures, the chances to see Teen Titans again in the future DC Universe animated original movie, and even potentially a live action film, all hinges on the sale figures, and this was last week. So, will we see more of them? Probably, but we just have to give them some support. Don't get me wrong. I understand how a lot of people will probably think the movie sucks because, like I said, the movie itself, in my honest opinion, was good. It's just that the title was a bit misleading. And, again, what the heck did Nightwing do? He was pretty much just a taxi driver. That's all he did. Yeah, he didn't do much. But overall, I definitely liked this movie. Yeah, I would de like, what, what would you rate this movie? 8 out of 10? Uh, 8, 7, 7.5, 7. that's... Somewhere in the acceptable range for a animated film for DC. So, basically, if you got nothing else better to do and you're thinking of, like, watching this movie, go right ahead. I mean, it's not a bad movie. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good flick. It's a pretty good flick. You'll have fun. You'll be able to enjoy it. It's just that the only thing is that the title is just a bit misleading. There really wasn't much. As a matter of fact, there wasn't even much interaction between Teen Titans and the Justice League themselves. Like, to be truthfully honest, there was not much interaction at all. The most you get is in the beginning when Damien did that outlandish stunt to stop the, um, what, well, the possessed, one controlling the weather. I can't think of their name at the moment. The weather wizard. Yeah, them, the weather wizard. And then Damien does an outlandish stunt to stop the possessed weather wizard, so. Hey, it worked. It did work. I mean, Batman still gave him crap for it, but hey, it worked. Hey, what works is what works. I mean, the only thing I don't really understand is I think, like, Batman was on. Well, not unnecessarily uptight because we've already seen how much Damien is a loose cannon, but he kind of said, he kind of like 
argued at Damien stating that, oh, you did that and now we don't have anybody to question or talk to. And I'm just like, Batman, did you really think you'd be able to question some type of demonic spirit? Like, I'm not the only, I'm not the only one that seems ridiculous in this, right? Yeah, there's not much sense talking to a demonic spirit who's trying to kill you. Exactly. So, like, yeah. I, I'm all for the detective business as much as the next guy, but I mean, you gotta face facts and logic here. Like, there was no way that thing was gonna give you much answers. Nope. Only thing I wanted to give you was death. Oh yeah, another thing. I like how Batman is the only one that's crazy prepared. Because when everybody's like getting possessed, Batman is like the only one that took neurotoxins to prevent that from happening. So points to Batman for being crazy prepared. Though personally, I would like to. I, I'm a Batman fan. No, like I'll admit it. No qualms there. So personally, I would have liked to have seen Batman done a little bit more than just zap Solomon Grundy by literally just leading him into like an electric field that's really it so that's just my little tidbit there but hey we got to see damien which almost makes up for it eh definitely would want to see more nightwing though i definitely feel like nightwing should have been in this movie i mean there was a lot of ample opportunities especially with that whole scene where him and starfire when they were in costume just had a subtle handshake and i'm just like who the heck are they fooling well they definitely uh did a lot more than handshaking on uh skype a little bit more unfortunately they weren't able to continue it because you know they wanted to have some fun no no not that kind of fun no like go to the carnival kind of fun and not even them not even bringing nightwing along sorry dick Grayson, but you're not good enough now while damien and raven were kind of getting it on a little bit getting a little bit chummy with one another Dick Grayson was just sitting at home, probably sulking about his misopportunity to date Starfire, which keeps getting pushed off, unfortunately for him. I mean, if anything, he was probably getting some good rest exercise. Well, anyways. So, yeah, all in all, the movie is pretty solid. It isn't that bad. The only problem that I saw was the lack of Nightwing. The title's a bit misleading, but it's still a decent flick. So, like I said, we 7.5 to 8 out of 10. We, we give that out of the movie. So, like I said, it's a decent movie. If you got nothing else better to do. But this is definitely worthwhile of holding up to the previously released movies in the animated universe for DC. Now, not as good as not as good as the Justice League Atlantis, which was one of my favorite movies in the series, but it definitely introduced us to a new realm of characters, the Teen Titans, and we might be seeing more of them depending on how this goes. But now, that's all we have for this review. And now let's go back to see some uh, other comic-related news going on. Gambit production is delayed until later this year due to script rewrites, and the and the current writing team is Reed Carolyn, who worked previously with the main character Gambit, who's going to be played by Shannon Tatum in the movie Magic Mike. I am not kidding you. Now. I am holding my reserves to see how it's going when he pens the latest draft, but for right now, it's on delay, and the director, Doug Liam, is going to go on to direct Amazon's first feature film, The Wall. So, unfortunately for him, but if this movie is anything good as the recently released Deadpool, then we are definitely in for a treat. Now, one thing that's interesting is that Ben Affleck only has two Justice League movies on to his contract. So, what can we see after Justice League 1 and 2? We're not sure, because um, unless they rehire him and re-sign him to a new contract for more films, which they definitely should, because Ben Affleck was pretty decent as Batman. Although many fans had their reservations going into him, but I say he did a good job. There's no way he dies in the upcoming Justice League, do you think? Uh, nah, Batman is too much of a central character. Only way they can do something like this is if they introduce Damien, which I don't see happening in the live action. They can't really do introduce Damien, because it's too, like, first off, we haven't really established much to where the current bat like where 
Ben Affleck's Batman is. Like, we know that at the very least, Robin, like Dick Grayson, is already come and gone. I'm assuming. So, and there's a whole thing that they also hinted that how Jason Todd has also come and gone and died. So, at the very least, we need to see some sort well, of evidence. We of, don't know if Jason Todd. Well, yes, there's another thing. These, these are all speculations here. The Red Hood might be out. Basically, the point I'm trying to say is we don't know which Robin might come next. Because, I mean, Damien is kind of way further down in the story. And if you know, like, the comic lore, there's Tim Drake, there's Stephanie Brown. There's a- the, o- the only thing I have to say is he's definitely been Batman for a while. Yeah, definitely. So the possibility of Damien already running out there and being loose is pretty likely. Yeah. I'm willing to bet on that. Yeah, but I personally think it would be a bit too soon for a live-action series. That's just my honest take. Unless they do Raze Girl for one of the side villains to go with Darkseid in the Justice League movie. I don't think Raze would try, would work with um, Darkseid, in my opinion. I don't see I'm not that. really saying a partnership. However, I'm saying a more two threats on one front. But see, the thing is, though, Raish is not an idiot. He's not, like, he's not stupid, nor is he power hungry. He's more calculated. He's more, you know, he thinks ahead for this. So That's why if Darkseid would be taking over and attacking, he would probably see a opportunity for him to sneak in there and find a little bit of window for himself. That's still a bit of a stretch, though, against Darkseid, because, I mean, it's not like don't get me wrong. I don't. It's not that I don't see this ha- as a possibility. It's just that what there's nothing Rage can really do against Darkseid. Even with all his vast, like all he has is like supposed immortality. That's literally it. No other powers. Not really saying attacking Darkseid. I'm saying while Darkseid is busy kind of taking care of the Justice League, Ra's al Ghul just kind of walks right in and uh, sits down in the. Wake of the battle and kind of grab some popcorn, put on the sunglasses. Um, that's more to me. That screams more. That screams more Lex Luthor, though. Yes, but we saw Lex Luthor and uh, well, sorry, we didn't see Lex Luthor because uh, well, the real Lex Luthor, please stand up, and he will be back more or less for the future. But for right now, Lex Luthor is kind of MIA in prison. So. We'll be seeing him in probably Justice League Part 1, and I think that can be transitioned over to Ray Jagul as a secondary in the second Justice League. Well, on the bright side, though, if they do go with the whole dark side route, they also can try to introduce a new hero, Orion. That's a possibility. Uh, Orion is uh, Darkseid's son, so definitely is a potential new hero they can also introduce. I'm not sure if they'll even bother doing it because they already have a set list of wh- what movies they're going to be doing for. So Yeah, and it just doesn't really seem like it's going to be able for right now. So we'll see going forward if that is a possibility or not. But a brief cameo, though, is definitely plausible, though. Some type of, like, evidence is definitely... Now we see behind-the-scenes footage of Guardians Galaxy Volume 2. Chris Pratt, a.k.a. Star-Lord, is rocking in the Milano. As you might know, that is the ship that is being used for their something good, something bad, a bit of both. Now, there's no official title for what the sequel's name will be other than Volume 2, which is just kind of a placeholder because James Gunn said the title will be too revealing to what the story is. Now, we can speculate for all we want, but for right now, we just don't have enough information to go on. Alright, so everyone saw the uh, Rebel finale, right? Yes? Good. Okay. Wow. Just, just, wow. Like, that was great in the battle between Ahsoka and Darth Vader. You got to see Ahsoka's torn between staying and helping the Master and trying to end him at the same time because she knows the threat that he has become, although she is denying it due to her not wanting to think that. We also have the return of Darth Maul, which definitely made it interesting as he battled both Ahsoka along with Kanan. Now, this kind of left on a cliffhanger with the final battle just being Vader walking out as Ahsoka is left in, but I don't think she's dead. I don't think they can kill a character that would be 
that highly involved in both the animated series that were released. Now, the producer of the Star Wars Rebel, Dave Filoni, was hesitant to give any information about Ahsoka's uh, fate. He said, I've already been devising certain specifics around the future of that character. Where she is, what's happening, if she dies, how would she survive if she did? All of those questions, I think they eventually need to be answered. For I wouldn't look to that, frankly, anytime soon. So, a long cliffhanger that might not be seen until end of season 3? Seems that way, but it definitely feels it. Now, he also said on why Vader was trying to kill Ahsoka, because Anakin really never wants to omit any other emotions besides anger, hate, and suffering. So, it was seen and shown that Ahsoka represents his past, and that is why she represents the knowledge of who he was and and wants to wipe that out. Now, his son represents the potential future because his son wouldn't know who he was. So, he could build a new galaxy together with his son, his apprentice, in his past, and he needs to destroy her. So, unfortunately for Ahsoka, which has become a fan favorite, and Ezra, oh man, Ezra, he was starting to go to the dark side from a entity who wasn't really revealing himself until it was revealed to be Darth Maul, and we see many dark side traits affecting Ezra. Filoni says he has to deal with the dark side as everyone does. We'll have to see. I think Ezra has been trained well by Kanan, but there are but there are some big repercussions for them. No one really came out of that unscratched. Ezra was bewitched and deceived a bit by Maul and Kanan. Went down a path that led him to being blind, but we will deal with those things pretty head-on. They're very important to the story. So that's where Season 3 will be heading. We'll be seeing a main importance on the continuation of the story arc of Ezra and how his training comes to the dark side and he's tempted with many different things that the dark side has to offer, which has once so many persuaded some Jedis to go to the dark side, or at least become in the middle in Grey Jedis. Now, another interesting part of the finale is Ezra holding a green cross-guard lightsaber. So, Kylo Ren is not the only one who has it. And this has sparked many speculations to whether he will be replacing the broken lightsaber with this one, although it does not seem to be looking that way. Now asked on why they put it in the series, Filoni said, Kylo Ren was really fascinating to me because he seemed to be a student of history, especially Sith Sith history and Jedi history. So I asked if I could put a crossguard lightsaber among the artifacts among the ruins of this temple. I just wanted to put it in for one shot as a nod that thousands of years ago, there were other Jedi who had it. So it absolutely was a Jedi. So we can get some more history on Kylo Ren, although he does not show up in the series, from the continuation of he is a student of history and the crossguard lightsaber was not created for him. Although, if you want to look at it, it kind of was in the order of filming, but in the way the universe is created, he is not. So what to expect for season three? Darth Maul is back, Kanan and Ezra being lured by the dark side, and the Inquisitors are not really dead. So we'll be seeing more of that in the next season. This was definitely made aware of when the new Inquisitor was released in this in the episode. Along with diving into the stories of Mandalorians and Sabine. Sabine's story will grow greatly in the importance in the third season. She will kind of come and she kind of comes up to stand next to Ezra as a as far as being an important player on the show. She isn't as much as a supporting character 
which I think transitions for her as a character. So what would I rate this? I would rate this a 10 out of 10, and although I'm kind of bummed that the animation is not as good as The Clone Wars, the story that this is built reminds me of when Anakin was starting to go to the dark side, and when he was tempted with the light and dark, and which side would he choose up to, and which side would he stick to? Or would he be in the balance of both? This reminds me of Ezra. Not as much, but definitely it has those tones of that story arc in the fourth season. And lastly, we have Kingsman 2 and the title that was released. The title will be called The Golden Circle. And the writer slash director of the film said, I don't, I didn't know if I wanted to direct this or not. I was worried about the villain. Spy films are only as good as their villains. Then one morning I woke up with this the whole storyline in place. A new villain plot. And he has said, I have other sequences you've never seen before. So this film this film looks to be a decent undertaking and looks to be worthwhile and worthy of the Kingsman name. Now, what are you looking forward to most in the next Kingsman series? Well, in the first in the first movie, they kind of Samuel Jackson as the villain villain, while very quirky, was very insane and had a very like grand scheme, which turned out to be very um violent and apocryphal. But and this one is gonna be it's a bit difficult on how to match that per se. I mean, to go from, like, a quirky villain like that, we probably would have to see a much more serious villain. I mean, sure, maybe, like, have a bit of a... Just, like, a little bit of a quirk, but they're mainly serious. Maybe, like, I don't know, maybe people don't take them seriously when they really are dead serious. I mean, something like that, but... I mean, that's the only way I can really see them. Like, going with another quirky villain such as that, uh... It, personally, to me, would kind of seem like they're trying to become too much like the first one, depending on what the plan is. I, I don't know. They would have to go with, the villain would definitely have to uh, take a major step up. And um... Now, the villain will be played by Julianne Moore. Okay. So we have a female antagonist, and her lair, as we've seen in, see in the new concept art, is called Poppy Land. I don't really... F- what? I don't really understand it. There's really no explanation of her character as to date, other than it was good enough to bring Vaughn back into the series. Well, if they're going with a female villain, this is definitely something different. I'm already interested in to see how they pull this off. The thing about a female villain, they usually are very much of the very like serious cutthroat type, so... Already, they're steering away from their previous villain, which, in my opinion, is a good thing. Now, I'm wondering, since their villain is a female, I'm wondering what exactly are they going to, like, do with this? Will they kind of hype up some kind of sexual tension between a bit of the main characters in some type of way? Like, I don't know. What, 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 what say you on that? That seems to be somewhat possible. The one thing that I don't get about Populand is that her lair seems to be like in the Amazon rainforest or something because it is in a old Aztec setting place with a thick vegetation overgrowing it. So, drug lord? Um, I'm thinking that are we going to get another environmentalist friendly type of villain here uh, as... I can either see this going that way or drug lord, because maybe heroin, poppy, I don't know. Uh, me neither. I I don't really know. They also the one thing I'm interested in is this is that England and the Kingsmen will be coming west to the wild wild west when they encounter the American version of their organization called the Statesmen, and it is led by a swaggering, sharp shooting cowboy. Uh, statesman. Not sure how I think. Not sure how to feel about the name. I'm already gonna. Say, I'm not sure what to think of the name. I love the name, person. Yeah. But then again, I'm more of the wild, wild west one of the duo. Well, yeah, but then that goes back into one of the main questions we had. Like, now that we know what their organization is called, the statesman. What would be the agents? What would the agents be called? Like. Are they going to be named after cowboys now? Like, what exactly, what are we working with here? Jesse James, Billy the Kid. It might be outlaws. Seems appropriate. Like, 
considering the line of work they're in. I definitely could see outlaws, and considering the statesman statesman's headquarters is a distillery of all things. Yeah. <laughs> They're really going to go for the American Wild Wild West Outlaws. So, I can see a outlaw theme going on. So do I, but what I really am curious to see in this second movie is that it's always been this, especially in among TV and films and whatnot, this trope on how Americans and English people can't really seem to get along very well. So, I'm really curious to see kind of how the the cast from Kingsman are going to be, like, how they're going to deal with this kind of cultural dissonance or difference between the Kingsman and the Statesman. So... The interaction between these two groups within the movie, that's going to be kind of the key set, the key here to really make this movie pop, in my opinion. Now, the leader of this is going to be Halle Berry. Leader of the Statesman? One of them. There's two. Okay. And there's no word out for who the swaggering sharp shooting cowboy is, but Jeff Bridges. It's got to be Jeff Bridges. Whoa. <laughs> What makes you what makes you think of that? R.I.P.D. <sighs> Can you not see him in that role? You can't say I'm wrong. Uh, you're right. I can't. He's made for it. So if you're listening to this by any chance, force yourself onto this production because they need you. Oh, and by the way, if we like get this right, you heard it here first. We said it first. Exactly. We said it first. <laughs> Now, that's all I really have on the comic side of things, but I am definitely looking forward to this. From the Season 3 of Star Wars Rebels, to more information on the Statesman, to what's coming next from the Teen Titans. Keep listening to East Meets West, and I'm Flamehawk. And as always, I am the Gentleman Snark. And catch us on Twitter at at Meets West, on YouTube at... East meets West. And our website is under development, but it is nerdvotaku.com. So feel free to check us out on all that social media links and be sure to like, favorite, com- comment, and subscribe for all to get all the news here. So until next time, stay classy. See ya. Hey, this is Flamehawk. I hope you enjoyed our weekly East Meets West podcast. Be sure to catch us every week on Fridays at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I run the American side of things, covering Marvel, DC, Star Wars, and much, much more. And as always, I run the otaku and Japanese side of things, from Shonen Jump and to other interesting anime news. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Your contribution is always appreciated. And remember, folks, stay classy. See ya!